reason that, that, that I, I show this to, is not to try to teach you biology, which is really funny, the, the fact that, that I would teach anybody biology because I am the self-proclaimed village idiot of biology. Uh, I have never taken a biology class. Uh, never took a biochemistry class, although I have taught, you know, a dozen of them. Um, sorry for the students. Uh, but uh, and I was a math and chemistry guy in, in undergrad and got my PhD in analytical chemistry, essentially doing peptide mass spectrometry. Um, it was before proteomics was a thing, so it just means I'm old. Um, but I, I show this to, to remind me to talk about the fact that Phosphorylation is, you know, it's dynamic. We've got a kinase pushing the phosphate, and we've got a phosphatase pulling it off. And so one of the, and it sounds like a simple issue, but one of the biggest issues that we have uh, in, in looking at a, um, a, a tissue or a cell is if, if it hasn't been frozen with phosphatase inhibitors, um, we're, we're probably going to lose something because the phosphatase inhibitor, uh, phosphatases are are pretty active uh, and they can go pretty quickly. And so even though we'll add them to the frozen cell pellet and, and thaw them with it, um, it really is best to throw those in uh, beforehand. We'll, we'll see better data. Um, uh, this is especially true if you're, if you're looking at tyrosine phosphorylation. So... Um, so when we're talking about mapping post-translational sites, we have to identify the modified peptides and we have to, to localize where that is. And you may think, well, that, that sounds easy. It sounds like the same thing. Um, but, but oftentimes, you know, there are multiple sites of uh, a, a potential phosphorylation uh, on the same peptide. And so I'm going to go over just a, a little bit here and probably bore you with, with too much detail, um, but just know that there is some math being done in the, in the background. And so um, some of the challenges early on, um, I say stoichiometry is not is not favorable. Uh, when you have phosphorylation of a of a peptide, most oftentimes it goes from zero percent phosphorylated to some small percentage. So the majority of that peptide or protein is not phosphorylated, and so you know this unfortunately happens on low abundance proteins uh, that are actually doing some you know some interesting work. And so now you've got a, a low copy protein that's phosphorylated a little bit some of the time. Uh, and so it's just a numbers game that makes it difficult. Um, the sequence coverage gaps, I kind of alluded to this yesterday. You know, are we going to be able to see this phosphorylation? Probably not. And not because I'm a pessimist, because I'm a realist. You know, if we average 30% sequence coverage, 70% chance, we're not going to see the region that you're interested in. Uh, we can do, you know, we can do better when we have more protein. Um, and then uh, finally, we have uh, unstable modifications are sometimes lost. Phosphorylation is is one of those. Um, it can be lost. Uh, it just means that uh, we're, you know, we're putting these uh, these peptides in a little bit of stress, right? I mean, they're in the in the body, they're they're all connected together and folded up nicely and have solvent around them and are, are happy. We're taking them and, and chewing them up with an enzyme, making peptides out of them. Their secondary structure is gone. And now we're squirting them out of a, a small glass capillary under voltage across uh, you know, a couple of centimeters of atmospheric air in the lab. They're undergoing these just collisions with background gas. And sometimes that can be enough energy to knock the phosphorylation off. And so the, the phosphate is a pretty good leaving group. Uh, and glycosylation uh, sometimes can uh, can be uh, pretty labile as well. Um, one of the issues that we have on a on a technical side is that when but because the the phosphorylation is such a good leaving group, the the chemistry of the peptide fragmentation kind of gets mucked up, and so the the easiest point of breakage in a phosphopeptide, if it's a phosphoserine or phosphothreonine, is just to lose the phosphate. So if you put in just a little bit of energy, that peptide will kick off the phosphate, and it's actually losing the phosphate plus an oxygen from the side chain. So it loses uh, a, a mass of 98, and it loses that as a neutral. So it loses H2PO4. I think that's right. Uh, and... And so you're left with now a, a, a peptide that used to contain uh, a phosphorylation site. So now it's either 
you know, it's a dehydroalanine or I can't remember what the name of the phosphate three. It's uh yeah, yeah, it's something else. I don't remember. Um but you look at uh, it, it phosphotyrosine, you're like, wow, this is this is actually kind of nice. It's a good good fragmentation. Well, because of the way the the structure of, of tyrosine, the, the phosphorylation is not as labile, which is nice. Um, and so if you if you put energy into it, it fragments and looks a lot more like a normal peptide. So we got lots of sequence information. You know, the serine and threonine, you know, we're kind of having to look down here at the low level for for um for sequence specific information, the information we're using to identify the peptide. And so now for counting strikes, you know, we've got we've got low stoichiometry. Uh it's, you know, some of it's going to fall off before it gets in the mass spectrometer. And now the third strike is even if we do see the phosphopeptide, it's not going to fragment as 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 well as a normal peptide. And so it's it's difficult. And so all of these things um really make it make it combined uh, difficulty in in identifying phosphopeptides. All right, so I'm going to paint, I'm going to keep making this negative until I turn around. So another problem is now we have, we have multiple sites of, of phosphorylation and we have to determine where the the site is. Um, and this is a, it's a really good paper came out of Steve Geeky's group uh, at Harvard. And uh, it basically, it's a computational model that looks through all of this noise in the spectra and says there's more evidence for the phosphorylation to be on one residue than on another. It calculates a probability score. And the only reason I have this is just to, to, to let you know when, when we report some of this data, uh, here's a, here's a blow up to show when we report the data, we're actually showing these calculations. And so these are phosphopeptides that we identified. And so uh, if we take the first one here, the, the data says that there's a 0.4% chance that this third residue, this threonine is phosphorylated. So it's probably not that. Well, there's a little greater chance this, this serine. So it's like, you know, almost 9% chance that it's that. Yeah, uh, but 91% of the, the fragments in the, the data say that it's this serine that's phosphorylated. Um, and so this is probably right, but the one that's 9% may actually be right too, right? It it could be that 9% of that phosphopeptide is phosphorylated on, on that residue. And so it's it's not on both, it's on one or the other. You know, we play the odds game. Uh, it's, it's, it's likely the one that's highest. Um, sometimes, I don't know if there's a one on this list, um, sometimes there'll be a, a, a case where two of them have 50%, right? It's one of the two, we just don't know which one. Uh, and so, but but we will get, uh, you know, we'll report data with these percentages and that's that's what they mean. Luckily, we can cheat a little bit and we can enrich the, the phosphopeptides. And that's really the only way that we're able to get to this. Uh, so if we just, you know, took the lysate, these, you know, all these strikes are against us. Uh, the, the, the levels are just too low and we can't do it. The, the problem is the way we're enriching is, is really not optimal. You think of, you know, enriching something, you know, you're doing a pull down. So you've got an antibody to something very specific and pulling it down you know, what we're taking advantage of are some interactions that everybody forgot about uh, since they took inorganic chemistry you know, however many years ago, right? So uh, if, we, if we take titanium uh, and we kind of suspend some titanium oxide, uh, it will chelate bind to the phosphorylation group and you can get some amount of of interaction there. And it's actually surprisingly good, but it's just kind of dumb luck. I mean, we're using coordination chemistry to to just base the fact that that, you know, titanium or iron will bind the negative charge uh, on a phosphate. Um, it has been around for years and years, uh, and I probably should remember the first report of it. The first I remember seeing it was in the in the early 90s, and it may have been been around for mass spectrometry before that. But it was all of the, the studies for for 20 years were plagued with really inconsistencies. Um, there is uh, it's it's a lot like chicken soup. And so people would would 
you know, report their findings, their protocol, and it worked in their lab. And if you tried it in your lab, it just didn't work. You, you know, you had to change one thing. You had to double the amount of resin or you had to, to, to add more acid or change the pH, you know, like everybody's recipe for chicken soup has the same ingredients, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a little bit different. Yeah. It's better here, better, better here than there. Um, and there was really a, a lot of question about what, you know, what this was, was it just really so unreliable that, uh, that there were just great discrepancies. And then a paper came out, uh, in 2018 that, uh, and this is, um, uh, I, I know, uh, Albert Heck here, uh, I, I don't know who uh, Lemur is, but he's the last author, um, but it, it, the, the mass spec work was done at Hex Group. And they showed that DNA, and, and this is one of those things looking back, you go, ah, this makes a lot of sense. But they found out that in the method, if you didn't get rid of the DNA, if you didn't shear the DNA, you, you really had trouble enriching enough phosphopeptides. And looking back, you're like, oh, it makes a lot of sense, right? You've got a phosphate backbone of DNA, lots of negatively charged. So it was just binding to the to the to the, uh, the the titanium or the iron. You you cleave and you get rid of the DNA and you you know you you chop it up and, and you get rid of it, uh, and then you can have a pretty reproducible um, phospho enrichment. And so this this explained why some methods of protein digestion worked better than others. Um, there's a method that Dennis talked about that that the people in the sample prep lab don't like is the 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 FASP or the filter aided sample prep method where we're spinning samples through a 30 kilodalton uh, membrane. That method always generated pretty good phosphopeptide data. If you did a solution digest of the same sample, it just wasn't as good. Didn't make any sense. Except now the intact DNA from those are held above the membrane. And after digestion, the peptides come through. And so you are separating the DNA from the protein, not really intentionally, um, but uh, this is, uh, I, I circle these areas of the chromatogram because if you look at this paper and you just read it, you go, okay, here's the standard protocol. Here's the optimized protocol. Oh, this figure is mislabeled. Oh, clearly the, clearly the optimized protocol would have the bigger peak. Now, all the phosphopeptides are down here in these little, little peaks. The big peak is the DNA. So, I guess I'm a little surprised that just shearing would, would help. I think it just gets rinsed away. Then, yeah. So then, in the in the cleanup, it's just not kept. Yeah. Um. So we've used a couple of different methods, um, and I, I I generally don't talk nice about thermo, even though they buy lunch and and we buy instruments from them. Um, I'll talk a little bit bad about them, uh, with these kits because I tried these kits. Um, I wish I knew, I wish I knew when sometime in the, I don't know, um, early 2010s or 12s or something like that. I tried them and they were awful. They just didn't work at all. Um, and then I was at a mass spec conference. I saw a poster using these kits and they had really, really good phospho data. And so I asked the person at the poster, I said, is this a new kit? He's like, no, it's the same, same kit they've, they've had for years. It's like, I, I don't believe it. I just don't, I don't think it's real. He said, oh, they changed the buffers. He said, the kit's the same, but they changed the buffers. It's like, I, I don't know. So, but the data was good enough that I tried it. And sure enough, it works. Uh, and it works and it works really, really well. Um, what we do is it's a it's a little pipette tip that has a little titanium oxide resin in it. You load your peptides in. Um, we take the the peptides that don't uh, stick and we collect them. We do a wash of this and we collect it. Uh, we then take those two washes and pass over a, another column, the the iron column, um, and then we take the the phosphopeptides enriched from the titanium and the iron, and we do something kind of crazy. We mix them back together. Think, why would you do that? Well, you know, you're, you're separating these two, and now you're mixing them back in the tube. I thought you were an analytical chemist. Well, it doesn't make sense. Well, they're not really completely selective. Um, 
you, you can have some phosphopeptides that will bind preferentially to one than another. It's kind of a capacity issue. Um, and so if you have a lot of phosphopeptides, you're going to kind of saturate the titanium and the remainder is going to go on the iron. Uh, if you have really low level phosphopeptides, you can combine, you can capture them with a titanium and then you'll get most of them off. Uh, and it works out, works out better, but uh, about half the phosphopeptides will bind to titanium, half will bind to the, to the iron and about half will be present in both. And so instead of analyzing this separately and having those, those peptides that are binding to both be penalized because now when you analyze them, they're half the abundance, halves in one, halves in another. We combine them and we fractionate them. Uh, and then we spend a lot of mass spectrometry time trying to uh, trying to identify them. Uh, this data is several years old. I, I, I kept it in here for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we started with a pretty small amount of material. So this was uh, um, uh, normal rat kidney cells, uh, 30 micrograms uh, of each sample. We label with a TMT sixplex. Um, and we enriched with titanium, we enriched with iron, and just did a, a two-hour gradient. So no fractionation, just uh, ran it. Uh, and we quantified uh, 9,000 sites, um, 9,000 phosphocytes uh, in this study, you know, starting with 30 micrograms of each, of each sample. And so it's convinced me, okay, this is, this is actually, you know, this is reasonable, this is pretty good. Um, my reality check is looking, always look at the, the percent of serine, threonine, and tyrosine. Because on average, you're going to have 80 to 85% serine, you know, 15 to 20% uh, threonine, and then usually 1% to 3% tyrosine. If you, if you ever see a study and it's got 5% tyrosine, at least half of their tyrosine identifications are wrong. If you haven't specifically enriched for it, it's not right. Uh, and so this is kind of my reality check on okay, these th this is the expected ratio that we should that we should see. Um, uh, in this study, we had six thousand peptides with only one phosphorylation site, um, about thirteen hundred uh, with two, uh, and then a thousand with one or two. So it was identified. You know that same phosphopeptide was seen. Uh, with one or two phosphorylations. And so um, these numbers are, are better now if we, if we do them with more material. So what we found is um, our, our standard TMT protocol, we use about 100 micrograms of material. Uh, for a phospho experiment, we wanna use 200 micrograms uh, because that just gives us uh, more uh, material to, to look at. And so our, our standard workflow for our, for our phospho TMT um, is after labeling, we take the majority of the material, we take 95% of the material and we do phospho enrichment. And we take 5% and we do the proteome analysis. And so, you know, that, that should tell you that, you know, even though we tell you we need 100 micrograms, we probably don't. I'm not going to tell you we need less. It's a lot easier for sample prep. And, and this digestion works really well because we're using 200 micrograms, but we can get by with a lot less. But we use 95% for the phospho enrichment because th those levels are just so low. Uh, and so from this, we, we have seen up to 30,000 phosphocytes. Um, I would say for, for typical projects, we're quantifying 10 to 15,000 sites, something like that. Um, and uh, the, the fractionation is something we really haven't uh, talked about uh, too much. And uh, I have a few slides on fractionation at the end. And if we want to go through them, we can, or if we want to go on to something else, we can do that. Um, this is a, a screenshot from um, a previous version of Proteo DA. And actually I was going to ask Stephanie, I forgot this morning. I, I, I haven't done this and looked at phosphodata and Proteo DA in a while. Are these features still there? No, that's okay. what's broken. The okay. software packages to do that isn't updated anymore. Gotcha. Coming soon. Yes, exactly. That's Com version two. Coming sometime. So, uh, but uh, it, it's 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 similar anyway. So we can you know we can look at the at the phosphopeptides. We can generate heat maps, 
Um, one of the things that I that I really liked about this this uh, this past version was we could you could look at, at upregulated phosphopeptides um, and look at the the motif calculation and and see if there's a you know particular you know kinase motif that that you that you recognize or you know if you're if you're upregulating kinase you should expect to see a certain amount you know from that but you might see you know other sites upregulated uh, as well. Um, I'm going to point you to just a couple of papers that are that are useful in this. Um, uh, this came out of the Broad Institute uh, uh, groups of uh, Manny and Steve Carr, um, where they they did a, a essentially a deep dive in literature and looked at at phospho specific site specific phospho pathways. One problem if you if you take phospho data and you do something like ingenuity, just because a protein has a phosphorylation that's associated with a pathway, they don't break it down into one of those sites being inhibitory and one of those sites being, you know, activating. And so it, it's, there's a, there's a definite disconnect there. This is a, this is a good resource to actually look at, uh, look at some data. Um, and then this is a, a good overview. Um, this was in 2019. Uh, again, from Albert Heck, um, who's done a, a lot of work um, uh, with with phosphopeptide enrichment and fragmentation. Um, I threw this in um, because of comments yesterday, and I say threw it in. You know, Dennis had his slides done like a month ago, and I had mine done at eight o'clock this morning. So, uh, but this is a reference on the uh, the phosphotyrosine. Uh, manuscript that that we had with uh uh shin Yu. i couldn't think of shin Yu's name last night uh shin was a graduate student uh in uh in art solomon's lab um he, he he was impressive he he came to one of these meetings and i went up to talk to him after the first day and thought he was a postdoc and he was starting his second year in graduate school and i was like oh man i second year in graduate school i didn't know which way it was up and this dude was sharp um but uh, what we found is that we could we could treat one of the cells with pervanidate. Again, we're inhibiting the the dephosphorylase, uh, and so you you push the the basal levels of the phosphorylation up, and then you could spike this into the TMT, and that's what these uh, these blue big bars are here. So you could lift this small signal, you could lift it up above the noise line. Uh, and the mass spectrometer could see it to switch on it to fragment. Um, we didn't invent the technique of of using a um, a channel and TMT at higher levels. That that's been done several times before. Uh, it's, it's done now in single cell. They'll do you know five thousand cells in one of the channels and then single cell in the others uh, to get to it. Um, but the use of the pervanidate as a as a phosphotyrosine boost was was a novelty here, uh, and it worked really well. So I didn't talk for an hour and a half, but uh, questions about phosphorylation. And then I got a few slides on, on fractionation uh, that we can talk about if, if, if we want to, or I can go sit down. Have you used that Kia three website that uh, Mike Washburn pointed out? I have not. I played around with it a little bit, but there's another website for kinases to try to find what's uh, associated with the enzymes. It's yeah. a KEA three. You can find it, but yeah, I, I, I have. try to kind of point people that direction too. Yeah, 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 that's a good idea. I got a question about experimental design, if I can. Sure. So um, we're trying to think of you know ways to so sort of so you've got your wild type right, and then we can do knockout, and then we can do maybe overexpression, and then try to get you know see some sort of pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, is that generally the way you'd suggest it? And also, I was curious with the knockout. Like we know, we when we have a conditional knockout where our kinase is gone after about an hour that we we induce the degradation. Um, is that long enough? Like when do we're trying to like pick a, the right time point so that we're not seeing secondary effects and that sort of thing? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, the you know, it's probably a couple of experiments. One is to to look at the time course, right, and to look at a few phosphorylation sites that you know. And and follow them over the 
over the time, right? That's that's probably um, that's a great experiment to do by DIA. And and I I didn't talk about phospho DIA because in our lab it's not really a thing yet. Uh, it will be. There there are, there are papers on it. There's software that does it now. The the Diane or DIANN package uh, allows you to do that. There are issues, um, technical issues that we need to overcome before we can do that with DIA and even the enrichment. So, you know, I, I talked about the coordination chemistry and we're kind of, you know, hijacking coordination chemistry to do phospho enrichment. That is not a reproducible procedure. Um, it is variable with sample amount, the amount of, of resin that you have, uh, pH, salt, phase of the moon, whether you're standing on your left foot or your right foot. it's it, There's variability. What I love about the TNT experiment is all of that variability is contained in one experiment. So however, you know, variable it is, for this experiment, all of these samples were treated the same. And so that's why I really like the data out of a, a phospho TMT. When we do phospho DIA, we're going to be doing those enrichments on every sample. And I know that we're introducing variability. And so we need to shore that up. Um, but it's it's difficult, you know, when when samples differ just a little bit in protein abundance. Stephanie can normalize for it and and we can, you know, that, that's really not that big a deal. Well, if that affects the enrichment efficiency, now it's a big deal because you can't normalize signal away or zeros to ones. Right. Yeah, there's only so much we can do. Yeah, it's like junk in, junk out. Yeah, and so well, I appreciate my sample prep. That's it's difficult, and so you know we we have people wanting to do phospho DIA, and we're just not we're not quite there. Um, but that would be a, a you know time course would make sense for phospho DIA. Um, it would seem like the spectra for serine phosphorylated peptides would be a real problem for DIA. You know, how do you generate libraries when they're useful library spectra to drive the interpretation when the fragmentation pattern so limited it's, and so un, often uninformative? It, yeah, it's low. And so, um, and uh, Diane does it better than, than other packages. Okay. Um, and it's because they, they have let their model learn on every published phospho spectra that they could get their hands on. So that's the, that's the neural network of the neural networks that we don't understand. They, yeah. And, and uh, not a knock on mic. I, we were talking about this yesterday. I, mean, I wish I knew what neural network really meant in that setting. Um, but it's, uh, you know, essentially the, 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 the algorithm is, is learning from the compendium of data that we've generated over the last 20 years Although I always argue that if you're looking at a paper and it talks about phosphorylation, if it's before 2010, I don't believe it. I just don't. I just don't. <laughs> uh, we weren't very good at it back then. Uh, but yeah, DIA is tough because of that. Yeah, right. So you're, you know, you're not, you don't have the the, the abundant signals. You're, you're, you, you've got the the low level signals, and so I think the thought of site localization is almost a joke with the IA data. Uh, it's going to have to be, oh, it's this site because that's the consensus site that everybody's seen from this peptide with a retention time of 38 minutes and, you know, master charge 720. I have a question, and this is a little unrelated to this, but you brought it up again. You have in there, there 13,000 odd, phospho sites that were identified, but then there were only 10,000 that were quantified. Yeah. How is that going to affect? Because I think a lot of times researchers come in and they go, wait a minute, is this smoke and mirrors? You know, you found this, but then when I want, I'm interested in that one. And you say, well, but that one wasn't quantified. Can you explain the difference between those? Yeah. And so it, it, TMT does a great job of generating signal values for almost all the channels. Um, and there are there are fewer missing values when it's in in one experiment. Phosphorylation, though, there there's missing values, and it's just an abundance issue. You know, most of the time in TMT, if you identify the peptide, 
there's enough signal for you to get um, a quantity for for that because there's enough ion signal because as you're selecting peptides randomly on, on abundance as the mass spectrometer is running, it's seeing things that are pretty abundant. Phosphorylation, we're taking peptides that are lower abundance and have lower abundance fragment ions that uh, you know the majority of that signal or that tag is being lost. Um, the 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 signal is being lost with a with the phosphorylation loss, and so uh, we have a lot of ion current that's not making its way to the tag, and so there are a lot more just low values because of just sensitivity. Yeah, it's just a just a numbers game. So in this study, I think it was quantified was present in half the samples. So so if I'm thinking about it, we're getting a a, a good enough MS two to be able to make an identification, but we don't get enough MS3 to get a quantification. Yeah, it's and that's that's tougher. On, that's usually not the case with TMT, but for phosphorylation it is. Um, should be better on, on the next generation instrument because it's more sensitive. So should be better. But Do you want not, to tell them the bad news about the pro? Uh, maybe. So th there's a the TMT Pro reagent um, allows you to do a higher multiplex up to 18. Now um, the the standard TMT reagent is up to 11 channels, and TMT Pro is 18. But one problem in, in order to to make enough space to put extra isotopes, they had to add uh, an amide linkage in the tag, and unfortunately, I wish they would have change chemistry a little bit because um, that actually fragments um, too early and so uh, it will it will fragment and you'll you'll lose some ion signal uh, there it loses enough ion signal that it hurts phosphorylation more than it hurts other proteins because we can't afford any loss in our phosphopeptide signals. We just, you know, talking about that, we're at the, we're at the cusp now. And now if we lose 20% of the ion signal, our, our phospho data from TMT Pro is, is pretty poor. We don't, people have done it and we've gotten data from it, um, but we recommend not doing it. Uh, we should probably have more material. Other question? Yeah. Sure. So, what what if you already have candidates? Um, you know, maybe you've done proximity labeling or pull downs, and you're like, well, I, I think these 50 proteins might be phosphorylated by this kinase or whatever. Is, is that addressable, or is there a way to go about that? You, or... if you if you think they're being phosphorylated, if you know the sites, then you can go the targeted route. Otherwise, you probably need a yeah phospho. You know try a, a, a micro scale phospho enrichment. And again, that's, it's, it's difficult because there's not much material, but it might, you know, it might help with a, with a, you know, smaller version, uh, you know, titanium resin. I mean, if it were for my research in the lab, I would probably try that. I would, I would probably try to make my own, um, you know, phospho enrichment um, tip using, you know, a, a small amount of uh, titanium oxide resin, uh, and and you know, try to try to enrich at the atom oil level. Everybody ready to go to sleep? Um, after this question, I'm sure it'll put everyone to sleep. Um, <laughs> I keep on asking questions about sample prep because I really want to get it right. Um, for this, uh, for, for phospho enrichment, um, especially talking about the pervanidate, um, if I'm doing a cell pellet and I'm snap freezing like a dry cell pellet, when yeah. do I introduce, uh, phosphatase inhibitors? I would do it at, you, you get the, the, the liquid off and right before you, you snap freeze, you can add it or you can snap freeze and you can add it on top. Okay. Just yeah. as long as it's either, e present. yeah, e either one. Okay, uh, awesome. But I, I like the idea of it being there. Uh, like I said, we're we're going to add it, but I, I I like the idea of of no risk of those things thawing before it gets on. Great, thank you. Yep. Oh, uh, I have a question. If we need to see the 
the another the post translation or uh, modification like uh, ubiquitination and the acetylation is is it also we use the just the TMT method or I I think so. I mean that that, that works reasonably well. Um, for other, so for like acetylation enrichment or ubiquitin enrichment, that's not currently a service that we offer in the lab, and I don't, I don't know that we will. I, I can't say that we that we won't, but I don't see that in the short term. Um, and so that would be an enrichment that you would need to do to the samples before you send them. Um, you know, TMT would be would be reasonable for that, um, only because uh, as it sits now. It's difficult to do DIA on those because of software reasons. And so I think TNT is probably an easier way. Um, but, you know, I'm guessing in the next two to three years, uh, you'll see a lot of DIA ubiquitin uh, settilation. Other questions? Right. You said you said you had some more slides. I do. There. I've got I've got a couple of slides on on fractionation, um, and, and we've 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 talked about this. Haven't gone into a lot of detail, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about about how we're separating these uh, these peptides before we we do the TMT. And so here's the the workflow again, where we uh, we take our proteins, we digest them. Um, and we actually, we use trypsin for digestion unless we're doing a, a phospho TMT project. And then we actually go to the extra cost of adding trypsin and lyse C just because you get a better, more complete cleavage. Um, and phosphorylation studies are, um, having complete cleavage is a little more important because phosphorylation itself can impede trypsin's ability to, to cleave. It impedes lyse C's ability as well, but but using the combination of them, uh, you can usually get around that and you get a more complete uh, cleavage. And so you're not splitting your your signal across multiple peptides with you know complete cleavage or partial cleavage. Um, we we label and we combine them and we do this basic reverse phase chromatography. So that's what I want to talk about just a little bit. Um, this first came out. It's like any any other technique. You know, it takes researchers you know, 10 or 15 years to realize something is, is really analytically useful. Um, I, I remember, you know, seeing these papers in the, in the early 2000s on, on reverse phase separation or using different pHs. And I thought, ah, that that's not, that's not really, you know, it was not impressive. So if you, if you look here, if you, if you plot, two different reverse phase separations that are similar. I think this is a phenyl column and this is a C18. And you can see they, you know, they correlate really well. You know, you wouldn't want to use this because the correlation is good. Now you can do it at pH 2.6 and 10, and there's a little more scatter, but I thought, you know, I can still, my eye still draws a correlation line there. So they're, they're correlated. Why would you want to do that? You know, so I went this route of looking at at Hillock. So uh, hydrophobic interaction, uh, or hydrophilic interaction, uh, and reverse phase, and that looks more like a shotgun blast. And so that's that that scatter is oh these are really not correlated. We're going to fractionate like this, and that's just really hard. Uh, <laughs> Hillock doesn't work well. Um, okay. Turns out it's just, I don't know, it's technically, it's not as easy as reverse phase. Um, and then there was another paper here, and it's kind of the same thing. So you're looking, uh, and this is out of um, uh, Ken Standing and, and Werner Inns lab in Manitoba. Um, we have pH 10 here, pH uh, 3 uh, here, formic acid. And again, you know, I saw this correlation, and I thought, you know that the, the, I, I can see that correlation line. Why would I want to fractionate like that? And and then it occurred to me, it's like, oh, but I'm not I'm not taking into account this the spread. And so if you look here um, at at 20 minutes, uh, if you take a fraction at 20 minutes on high pH, the peptides that elute at 20 minutes are going to elute from eight minutes to 38 minutes at low pH. I was like, oh, that's why it's a good method. 
reverse phase is a great way to fractionate peptides because you get good chromatography. You get nice narrow peaks. Um, it's reproducible, you know, temperature controlled. Recovery is really high. The sample always binds when you put it on the head of the column, unlike Hillock, which seemed to bind on every other Tuesday or something. Uh, so here in this in this paper, they they show what uh, I guess I should use the mouse for those online. So this is fraction five, uh, and you can see well, there's you know there's a there's a good separation. This is fraction twenty five, and here they're just overlaying the chromatograms, and and then in this D panel they actually combine the two fractions and ran them on the mass spectrometer. You can see, oh wow, it's it's covering a lot more of the retention time window at low pH going into the mass spectrometer. And so this is what we started doing about the time that this paper came out. Uh, and this is from Dick Smith's lab. Uh, and again, showing how you can you can take different fractions and recombine them and fill up the chromatogram. Uh, this is our offline high pH fractionator. We do this on a one millimeter column, which to people, most people doing chromatography is a small column to us. It's like garden hose because we're running this thing at 70 microliters a minute. Um, our buffers are really easy and Dennis makes them up. And so I'm probably saying this wrong, but I think it's 10, mill 10 millimolar ammonium hydroxide in water and acetonitrile. Uh, and so the the great thing about that is that there's no salt. And so after we do fractionation, we can dry these down, resuspend them, put them on the mass spectrometer, and not worry about any contamination. Um, this is an example of a chromatogram. And I think, oh, nope. Oh, my, my lines are cut off at the bottom. So typically what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a, a fraction uh, and combine I think this this one was was designed when we were doing twelve super fractions, and so we were taking a fraction here, twelve fractions later, we're taking that fraction. We were combining all of those into one mixture and then running that on the mass spectrometer. And so that way it looks like the complexity of a lysate every time we run it. So we're having the mass spectrometer, you know, has hydrophilic peptides, has hydrophobic peptides, has peptides in the middle. It's just not all the same peptides. Uh, and so uh, now we've moved to 18, what we call super fractions. Uh, so it's combining, you know, basically every 18 fractions together. Um, the The more fractions we take, the the better off we're going to be in terms of, of simplifying the mixture. But we don't want to take so many fractions that we split the peptide into neighboring channels. And so we're we're doing this on really good chromatography, and so the the peaks are about 15 seconds wide at baseline, and so the fractions that we're taking are one minute. And why would you take a one minute fraction for a 15 second? Because that means only about one out of every five peptides is going to be saddling between one fraction and the other. Uh, and so we're trying to minimize that. We're trying to keep all the peptides in a single bucket. Um, but this is this is how we do our fractionation for for the phosphorylation and for TMT. We may move to a version of this for DIA um, to limit complexity and to be able to run uh, a little bit faster. Mike's wheels are spinning. And he's going, oh, I think I could do this. So. And, uh, we instead of gas phase fractionation, but instead of gas phase fractions, you could do this. And you would probably have, you you would end up loading more. the The advantage of fractionating and loading on nano LC is that we can only load one microgram on nano LC. So if we load one microgram of a lysate, that's that's all we can load. But if we can take that lysate and we can fractionate it into twelve different fractions, now we can load one microgram of each of those fractions. So it's like we're loading. 12 micrograms of lysate. And so now those peptides and proteins that are that are tenfold below our detection limit are now up to our detection limit. 
this is why I almost didn't show this because late in the day. Take it back. Other good. questions. I appreciate you staying awake. All right. Thank you.